I was a student in Berkeley uh, from 1960 to 1963, the same years that Manfredo was a student in Berkeley. And uh, I had one class in common with Manfredo, which was in differential geometry, and Chern was the teacher. And Manfredo was uh, 13 years older than I was at the time, and uh, he was certainly the most elderly gentleman in the class, and he was certainly the most distinguished um, person in the class because he was always well-dressed, always smiling, and he just uh, seemed so different from the people in the class who, this is Berkeley in the 1960s, where not being elegant was the mode. <laughs> I mean, people were not at all like Manfredo. Manfredo was certainly, as far as I was concerned, the smartest in the class. So I would definitely try and sit next to him as often as I could. Chern, I don't know if any of you, have, many of you have had this opportunity to hear him lecture, but Chern would give talks where there were equations and equations and equations, and I didn't understand it. So I would really try and get next to Manfredo and ask him, was omega a one form, a two form, a matrix of one forms, a matrix of connections? What was omega? Because Chern was writing omega, omega, which omega is d theta, d theta plus gamma is equal to gamma i j. I had verbal understanding what was going on. Manfredo understood, so he was able to tell me what at least the differential forms were. Uh, just concerning uh, Brazil, when I finished in 63, Manfredo finished in 63, I went to Columbia University to work, and I shared an office with Ellen Lima. And uh, we worked together, got to know each other, and I learned lots of mathematics from Ellen there. And in particular, I was trying to understand why Manfredo and why Ellen were going to return to Brazil to, to work. For example, Ellen that year solved the conjecture of Milner, and Milner invited him to Princeton to give a talk on it, and he came back from, uh, from the talk, and a few days later he got a letter from Milner asking him if he'd like a job in Princeton the following year, and asking him if he would publish the paper in the annals that uh, he had written. And Ellen decided, no, I'm going back to Brazil. And Manfredo and Ellen both were uh, doing something I didn't understand at the time, and I thought, my gosh, they're going to a place where there are no libraries, there's, there's no real university, there's, there's so few people in geometry, there was nobody, how come they're going back? And for a young man, an American as I was, and I still am, and uh, the United States at that time, you could have a job in any university in the United States, it was certainly very well paid compared to the student scholarship we were receiving. I didn't understand it. But certainly, I'm glad to say that now I do understand it very well why they returned to Brazil, why Manfredo came back, why Ellen came back, why Jaco Paldis came back. People who have got, could have gotten jobs in any of the major universities in, in Europe or the States could have had a career that was certainly, professionally speaking, uh, financially better, easier from the point of view of working conditions, et cetera, et cetera. But they created IMPA. I mean, they created this fantastic institute that we're sitting in right now. They created, when you go to Fortaleza, you go to Maceió, you go to these universities, you have all these groups of mathematicians doing geometry. And you have, you look at archive and you see every week, I have the impression there's at least one paper that's coming out in archive now from somebody in Brazil, some place in Brazil, uh, concerning minimal surfaces. This is Manfredo. It's a, just an incredible heritage. He did a marvelous, marvelous thing. Um, when I was asked to give this talk, I, I wrote to the person who invited me to give the talk and said, do you want to give a talk that I should talk about the work of Manfredo or should I give a mathematical talk? And he answered me, a mathematical talk. So I gave a title which is the usual stuff you do when you give a mathematical talk. You prove a theorem, you state a theorem, and you talk about the theorem. 
but it's, it's not quite appropriate to do that. So the title I gave for this talk, I think perhaps at the end or towards the middle, maybe I'll be able to say something about the title of the talk, but I decided to talk about the notion of stability and the theorem of Manfredo and the importance it's had and why it's been so important for mathematics. So the theorem in question uh, was quoted by uh, uh, Fernando this morning. The theorem concerns stability of minimal surfaces in R3. So this was uh, Manfredo. And uh, uh, Peng, who proved that if you take a complete minimal surface immersed in R3 that's stable, orientable, now we know this hypothesis is not necessary, orientable, then it's a plane. So it's embedded and it's a plane. So I'd like to say why this theorem is important and why I personally, every paper I write in minimal surfaces now, I think I use this theorem. I mean, it's just so, so useful in the subject that we work in now. It's incredibly useful. Of all the theorems Manfredo has proved, he's proved some really beautiful theorems, this one we use all the time. Why? So I'll try and explain that to you and give you an example of a really pretty theorem in R3, just where one uses this. And uh, it's true, as it was mentioned this morning, that Doris Fisher Colbury and Rick Shane proved this theorem independently. So this was proved, published in 1979, and this was published in 1980. And they proved a more general theorem. They proved that uh, take a stable, complete minimal surface that's orientable, immersed in a three manifold, which is complete and a positive Ricci curvature, non negative Ricci curvature, then sigma stable, sigma stable. then it's totally geodesic. Geodesic. So in particular, if n is R3, it's a plane. OK, so why is the notion of stability? Uh, no, let, me, let me point something out that, that's interesting uh, also. Uh, so Jim Simons was also a student in Berkeley in these years. He, he finished in 62. We finished in 63, so he was before us. And when his thesis was not on minimal surfaces. But after his thesis, he started thinking about minimal surfaces and produced a fantastic paper, which was published in 68, which uh, contained uh, really the idea that one can do for minim with minimal surfaces what one does for, with geodesics and geometry and Morse theory. Uh, dynamics, uh, index of operators, elliptic operators, all the things one does with geodesics to prove beautiful geometric theorems, minimal surfaces have the same possibility. And he gave examples where he solved plateau problems and where he uh, solved the Bernstein theorem up to dimension seven in this paper. And as was mentioned, Manfredo Chern gave a seminar in this lecture in 68, which I, did, I just discovered this this morning, listening to Fernando. And Manfredo was, was at this uh, conference. And Manfredo started thinking about minimal surfaces. And he started thinking about stability. I think Manfredo was one of the first people after Jim Simons to uh, realize that stability was so important and so interesting. So he proved uh, this theorem about uh, minimal surfaces in R3 that are stable being planes. And he mentioned in the paper, uh, well, no, uh, no, I guess the story I, that I heard from Fernando was that he gave a talk on this. And he asked the question. And Jim and Rick was in the talk. So Rick started working on it. and that's. That's how this paper came up. In any case, 
uh, <coughs> stability is a fundamental part of the geometry of minimal surfaces. This corresponds to minimizing geodesics. And you know all the theorems one proves concerning minimizing geodesics. For example, the B Bonnet theorem, that if you take a surface whose uh, curvature is greater than or equal to 1 over r, which is the curvature of the r-dimensional uh, sphere, then uh, its diameter is less than or equal to the diameter of the r-dimensional sphere, that is pi r. And then this theorem was generalized to dimension n by uh, Myers, where you suppose the Ricci curvature is greater than or equal to uh, n minus 1 over r squared, not, uh, not uh, 1 over r, it's 1 over r squared is the curvature of the sphere radius r. So the Ricci curvature of, a, of an n sphere is n minus 1 divided by r squared. So if the Ricci curvature of m is greater than or equal to that number, then its diameter is less than or equal to the diameter of the n sphere, which is pi r. That's the Myers theorem. And we call that now the Bonnie Myers theorem. But this is proved using geodesics, the, the notion of minimizing geodesics, and the notion of looking at the second variation of arc length along the geodesic when you consider variations of the geodesic. The linear operator that co comes up that we saw this morning. So uh, Manfredo pursued that idea. And uh, this idea permits one to obtain a multitude of theorems where you get global results about the geometry of the ambient space or the topology of the ambient space just by studying uh, minimal hypersurfaces in the space. And in particular, minimal hypersurfaces that minimize area on compact sets, so-called stable minimal hypersurfaces. Rick Schoen and Yao pursued this uh, in many different ways over the years following this, and they managed to prove great theorems when uh, the scalar curvature is uh, greater than or equal to zero. In particular, they proved the positive mass theorem uh, using this idea. They proved that uh, any three-dimensional manifold that's complete, let's say a compact three-dimensional manifold that has positive scalar curvature, has the property that it's topologically classified. It's a direct sum of S2 cross S1s with quotients of the three sphere by finite groups. So these marvelous geometric theorems come out of this notion of stability that is developed just the way you do geometry with geodesics. I'd like to give one example of an application of this, which is a pretty example. And then after that, I'll get on to what I would have talked about if I didn't say what I'm saying now. So the application is a theorem which is called the strong half space theorem. strong half space theorem of David Hoffman and Bill Meeks, which says the following. Suppose sigma 1 and sigma 2 are complete, properly immersed, properly immersed minimal surfaces in R3. That are disjoint. Then they're both planes. Sigma 1 is a plane and sigma 2 is a plane. They're parallel planes. Let me give you the idea. Step one. Suppose sigma one is a plane. For example, the xy plane of R3. And sigma two is above the plane. Sigma 2 has z coordinate greater than 0. 
we want to show sigma 2 is a plane. So the first step is to show that sigma 2 is a plane. Then step 2 Given sigma 1 and sigma 2, find a plane between them. Find a plane P between sigma 1 and sigma 2. So then you apply step 1 and you finish. They're both planes. Step 1 does not use Manfredo's theorem and Manfredo paying and Rickshaw and David Dorsey Colbury. Step two uses that theorem. Okay, so step one. How do you prove step one? So here, here's the xy plane. Call this p, z equals zero. And here is sigma, this immersed, properly immersed, minimal surface above the plane. Now, properly immersed means in any compact set, sigma is compact. So it doesn't have accumulation points on P. You're not going to have accumulation points on P and be proper. Now, this plane here, start lifting it up slowly. What happens? If you touch it at a finite point for the first time, like this, then the maximum principle says sigma is equal to a plane. The maximum principle says if two minimal surfaces touch at a point, then they're equal if they're connected. So by lifting up, you can suppose that sigma is asymptotic to P. So you can suppose there are points P, N, and sigma. The Z coordinate of the point goes to 0, and P, N goes to infinity, the norm of P, N. So you have these points here. Pn getting closer and closer to P at infinity. Now, you can take some ball here. Imagine this is the origin. Take some ball B in the space, three-dimensional ball, that doesn't touch sigma. Because it's proper, you can find such a ball centered at a point of the xy plane. Now we're going to do the following. Look at the family of catenoids, rotational minimal surfaces that are embedded, which depend on a real number lambda, which are given by the rotational surface z is equal to lambda inverse cosine hyperbolic x over lambda. So this is the family of surfaces which I'll call cat lambda, depends on lambda. Now what does this look like? When lambda goes to zero, this cosh is like exponential when you go to infinity. Cosh minus one is like a uh, log. So this is like lambda log x over lambda plus little o of one when lambda goes to zero which means the following. So here we have this rotational surface. Let's, let's think of the, the axis. The lambda's 1 looks like this. This is 1 lambda. When lambda goes to 0, symmetric, looks like that. So now you're rotating this about the z-axis, so here you see catenoids, family of catenoids. But if you think about it now, what's happening at infinity here? I claim that what you see, a log r over r goes to 0 as r goes to infinity. So what you see here, if this is the origin, you see a doubly covered This is lambda going to 0. The curvature blows up here. So this is a surface of revolution. 
And what's happening is you're converging to an any compact set here. I take a compact set K here in the xy plane. I'm converging to this as a multigraph, two sheets, and it's converging uniformly to K if K does not contain the origin. So this is converging to the plane with a blow-up point at the origin. And then it goes up to infinity because eventually log goes to infinity. So you see the picture, lambda goes to zero, these things. When you get far away and you look at this catenoid and far away, you see a picture like this, a doubly covered plane. <coughs> okay, so what does one do with this? So <coughs> I want to consider the part of the catenoid that's below P. So here, think of, uh, think of, let's do the following. Let, let's, uh, this is height zero. Let's go up to height delta here, positive, that's inside the ball. So this is inside this ball B. And let's consider this plane. And let's take uh, the catenoids converging to this plane and look at the, mid the, the part that's below. I want it to be orthogonal here. That's the plane of symmetry. Okay. Now if I take a smaller circle here and I look at the lambda there, then it goes like this, the smaller circle. And eventually, when this circle shrinks down to this point here, you're getting something that comes up to any compact set K here, like this. Eventually, you do this. So that's at height delta. But now on these catenoids that I drew, I want to pick out compact annuli. So here, I'll call this one here, this uh, F1. Then I take a smaller circle, and I call this F2. And eventually, I'll, I'll just draw F, Fn, so this was epsilon here we have Fn. So as lambda goes to zero, you shrink this down, they go up to this height epsilon here. Okay, that's, that's this compact minimal annulus. Compact minimal annulus. So now let's go back to height zero, P, and we have our surface converging here, and we have these points Pn. So eventually, since the z coordinate goes to zero, eventually these points get below height epsilon. So here's the ball, B, and here's a height epsilon. And I made these catenoids here these compact annular catenoids like this, Fn boundary here. So uh, the point is, these catenoids, compact catenoids here, go out to infinity and go up. So what's going to happen is there'll be a first time lambda such that I'm going to touch sigma on one side because sigma is proper. These compact annuli vary continuously. These, this minimal surface here gets as low as I want. So necessarily, there'll be a first time that uh, one of these compact annuli will touch sigma. Then you apply the maximum principle, and that compact annulus has to equal sigma. 
But then that means that sigma itself is a catenoid. But sigma is not a catenoid because that catenoid goes down to minus infinity. So, and this sigma stays above height zero. So that's a contradiction. So this family of catenoids and the maximum principle proves that when sigma one is a plane, sigma two cannot be in the upper half space. Just the maximum principle and this one parameter family of catenoids. They're just a homothety of one fixed catenoid. <coughs> now, how do you find step two, a minimal surface, a, cat, a plane between sigma one and sigma two? Well, here's, we're in R3, so there's some three-dimensional domain W here whose boundary is part of sigma 1 and sigma 2. It's not, maybe not everything, because obviously in this picture you see you're leaving things out. But the boundary of W is contained in sigma 1 union sigma 2. And the boundary of W is mean convex. What does that mean? That means that it's a barrier for solving plateau problems. This angle here is always less than or equal to pi. It's less than pi, as a matter of fact. So if I start sweeping out by surfaces and going across this, because this is minimal and this angle is less than pi, you're not going to reduce area when you pass this barrier. So any minimizing sequence of area surfaces is going to stay inside W. So the W is a good place to take a minimizing sequence of surfaces, areas with 10 to some number going down, because necessarily you're going to stay inside. You can modify the sequence so that you stay inside W. You can solve plateau problems. So what do you do? Take some compact arc, gamma, from sigma 1 to sigma 2. P, Q. Here's this compact arc. And you take some Jordan curve that links it. Gamma, N. So gamma, N links gamma, links <coughs> gamma. And I want this to gamma n to diverge. So I want uh, uh, this outside the cylinder x squared plus y squared is equal to n squared. Gets outside. It's going to infinity as n goes to infinity. Then I solve the plateau problem for this Jordan curve. Take a least area minimal disk with this boundary, dn. You can do this because the boundary of w is a barrier for solving the plateau problem. I'm cheating there, but nevertheless, it's OK. I have to make that precise. So you get this least area minimal disk with boundary this curve. And because it links this compact arc gamma here, there's a point of intersection. Necessarily, this, this dn intersects gamma, this compact arc. So now you take a bigger one, gamma m. You let m go to infinity. You get these dms, these, these minimal disks. They all intersect gamma. And because the least area, one, can, one knows that these least area disks have a subsequence that converges to a complete, stable, minimal surface. That's the subsequence converges to a stable, minimal surface. Sigma infinity. That's in W, because each one is in W. 
Beim Ampredo and Peng's theorem and Fischer Colby Schoen is a plane. Sigma infinity is a plane. So that solves step two. I think this is a beautiful theorem. Obviously, you might not have understood the one parameter family of catenoids. You might not have understood this argument here. But you can go home and think about it and say it's reasonable. And you see that there's a, there's a real theorem there. And this idea here of constructing this minimal surface sigma infinity by this process is an idea that Yao and Schoen used to prove the positive mass theorem for asymptotically flat three manifolds. <coughs> OK. Now I can sort of begin the mathematical talk that I had prepared. <coughs> oh, I, I should mention, so this, let me mention why stability is so important in this subject. When you study minimal surfaces or surfaces in a submanifold, you want to understand the global geometry. One of the first things you'd like to understand the surfaces with bounded curvature. Why? Because when it's bounded curvature, if you take any point P, locally you can write the surface as a graph over a little disk in its tangent plane by geodesics orthogonal to the plane. And you can study graphs locally to understand their geometry. Well, minimal graphs is a very well-studied subject. Minimal graphs are the first things people looked at from the point of view of partial differential equations. And certainly, one knows everything about the local equations for minimal graphs. You have nice compactness properties. If you take minimal graphs over a disk of radius epsilon in a plane, in a tangent plane, and if, uh, if they're a bounded distance from the plane, you have capacity. The subsequence converges to, again, a minimal graph over that uh, delta disk. So uh, one would like to reduce things to, if you have a problem in minimal surfaces and you want to prove that you understand something, you'd like to first do it for bounded curvature. How do you, if the curvature tends to infinity for a sequence of minimal surfaces, and you're trying to get a convergent subsequence, what you do is a blow-up argument. And you apply things like this Manfredo theorem, the stability theorem. What does that mean? If you have a sequence sigma n of minimal surfaces and points pn and sigma n where the curvature is going to infinity, then you take a little ambient ball around the point pn, and you rescale things, essentially, so that the curvature becomes one at the point. And curvature becomes less than or equal to 1 in the neighborhood. And then you think of this being in R3 just by using geodesic uh, coordinates from the point to put this ball in R3. And you just transport the metric to this ball in R3. So it's not the Euclidean metric anymore because you blew up the metric that you had to begin with on the ambient manifold. But now, if the curvature keeps on blowing up, you keep on doing this, then in the end, the metric in the ball Become, the ball becomes bigger and bigger in R3, and the metric becomes the flat metric. So you get a minimal surface in R3 in the limit, and that minimal surface in R3 has bounded curvature. So uh, why is stability coming into the story? It has curvature, one say, at the point that you started blowing up, because you've got you blew, that this curvature very big, and you rescale to make curvature 1. We have a surface here, curvature 1, uh, and you look at it in R3. Now that surface that you get, maybe the original surface in the original manifold came back and spiraled and sort of like was dense in the manifold. So when you blow up, you could uh, get something that's almost like dense in R3. So it's curvature 1, but maybe you see lots of sheets of this curvature one surface. This was like the origin of R3 where you did you fixed the blow up points, and you don't understand what you, what you have. But what you do have, all these sheets have the same bounded curvature, less than or equal to some fixed constant, a con constant uh, essentially one here or four. And it's not hard to prove because of the 
fact that now that you have a bounded curvature, that the closure of this object here is a minimal lamination. So you have a, either a minimal lamination in R3, or if you don't have a minimal lamination, you just have one properly uh, embedded surface of bounded curvature. Now, if you have a minimal lamination, it's not hard to see that one of the leaves is a limit leaf of the lamination. That is convergence to one of the leaves. That makes this leaf stable. If you have a, it's not hard to see that uh, a limit like this has the property that it's area minimizing on compact sets. So this is stable. So by Manfredo's theorem, it's a plane. But it can't be a plane because the curvature was one at the origin. The curvature is uh, it's not a plane, contradiction. Therefore, this lamination property doesn't occur, and you only just have one surface in R3 of bounded curvature. So you reduce the problem to something you understand. So this theorem of stability that I just wrote down is used all the time whenever you do blow up on minimal surfaces or constant mean curvature surfaces. And I guarantee you, in our papers, we're blowing up all the time. I mean, you're really trying to understand things that happen. And the, the basic thing is start proving the objects have bounded curvature. So eliminate blow up points. And then whenever you do that, you're using the steer. Uh, another reason, <laughs> so this is in between quotation marks. I didn't used to do geometry. After Berkeley, I didn't understand churn. The only other teacher in geometry I had was Rene Tom, who was visiting Berkeley at the time. And Rene Tom, I don't know if any of you, many of you heard him lecture, but he taught different geometry of curves and surfaces. I didn't understand the word he was saying. He had an accent in English that was horrible. This, the accent was incredibly, I couldn't understand the words. And, and when you're a young student, a young American who's never been abroad, you want to say, well, why can't you pronounce things? Why can't you make the words come out so we can understand them? I couldn't understand them. Anyway, geometry was something I decided not to do as a PhD, so I didn't do it. And for about uh, 12 or 10 years after my PhD, I didn't do geometry at all, metrics, nothing. I did foliations in the 70s. And I'm walking in the street with Andre Hefliger, and he says to me, Harold, tell me, is there a foliation of R3 by minimal surfaces that are not all just parallel planes? Now, I never thought about minimal surfaces before. This is 1975. But this question, I thought, my, I know foliations. I know what a surface is. I know the definition of a minimal surface. I should be able to figure it out. And I thought about it. I thought about it. I thought about it. And uh, I, I was, at that time, Dennis Sullivan was in Paris. And uh, I mentioned the problem to Dennis. And he liked the problem, too. And he thought about it. He thought about it. Thought about it. We couldn't do it. But in the process, I was learning more about minimal surfaces. I don't know what Dennis was doing, but I was trying to figure out what was going on. And I got interested. It was really an interesting problem. And Dennis goes to Rio, to a meeting in Rio in 75 or 76. And he comes back. He says, Harold, I was going on a walk in the mountains someplace in Rio. And there was this young guy. And I mentioned the problem to him. Is there a foliation of R3, not but parallel planes? And he answered me right away. He said, no, they're all parallel planes. I said, there is no such foliation. They're all parallel planes. <laughs> and then he said to him, well, why? He says, because they're stable. And the stable minimal surface in R3 is a plane. Well, Dennis didn't know what stable meant. He comes back and he tells me this story. And I didn't know what stable meant either. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, what was the guy's name, this young guy's name? It was Rick Schoen. <laughs> oh, it's funny. So I guess it was, it was later in 75, because his paper he published. Well, he, he, he maybe he knew. When did Manfredo really know that he could prove this, that is uh, a plane? Does anybody know? What year? In any case. Uh, then from that point on, I became interested in minimal surfaces. So I studied what stable means, I studied minimal surface, and I've been doing it ever since. So Avoid questions, and you know, your whole life can change. In particular, I don't think I'd be in Brazil now 
if I had not had that conversation. Because I came to Brazil essentially from Manfredo and the fantastic environment that he had created here in this kind of geometry. I was just, you know, I like this kind of geometry. So that question changed my whole mathematical career afterwards. Interesting. Okay. So let me pose a question now, which is really the subject of the talk. Suppose we consider a three manifold, which is complete and not compact, Riemannian, Riemannian metric G. Complete, not compact. The question is, is there properly embedded minimal surface in it? I don't know the answer to this question. I don't even know if M is R3 with some rem complete Riemannian metric. I don't even know that case. Uh, how does one attack such a problem? <coughs> how, how does one attack such a problem? How do we produce minimal surfaces? You know, people construct minimal surfaces, and R3, the classical way to do it was using the Weierstrass representation, the formula for meromorphic data, the Gauss map, and uh, integrating with the Euclidean metric. Another way we construct embedded, properly embedded minimal surfaces in three manifolds was take some polygon and suppose a geodesic polygon, and suppose the edges of the polygon have the property that there's an ambient isometry, which is rotation about pi of each edge, like an R3. You take any polygon, take a segment of a straight line segment, you always have the ambient isometry of R3, which is rotation by pi about that segment. OK, now you consider your polygon. Take a least area minimal disk that's embedded with boundary of the polygon, if you can find it. Maybe it's a knot and you can't find an embedded one. But take a nice polygon such that there's some least area embedment minimal disk with that boundary. Call that D. Take an edge. Take your ambient isometry. Rotate D by pi to get another minimal disk on the other side. Now, if the polygon is chosen appropriately, they're not going to intersect, so you'll have extended to something that's embedded and bigger. And you do this for each edge. If you chose the polygon correctly, you're going to get a properly embedded minimal surface in the space. So the ingredients there were what? You had to know that you had uh, the polygons with the edges, the geodesic edges, which admitted these rotations by pi. And you had to be able to solve plateau problems. And you had to choose things correctly to get the examples. So that's one way that one constructs minimal surfaces. And that's certainly the whole story of periodic minimal surfaces in, in R3, I mean, that's, that's a world of itself that many people spend years working on. In particular, I've worked on this a long time. Uh, you get nice doubly periodic minimal surfaces just by doing this simple process here. You extend it by reflection like this, and you do this here. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Here you get a nice uh, periodic minimal surface. If you do it right, it's properly embedded. Okay, that's one way. Another way is what? Another way is uh, min-max theory. That's been fantastically successful to answer this question when the ambient manifold here is a closed manifold even in dimension up to seven, take a closed Riemannian manifold, ask the same question, then we have this fantastic theorem of Antoine Song, 
student of Fernando, this recent theorem that says if you take a closed M in, N is less than or equal to 7, then there exists an infinite number of closed embedded minimal surfaces. An infinite number in M. Now this, this has a long history, this theorem, and Antoine here is climbing up almost to the top of a mountain, and that mountain started with Algram Pitts, and the mountain became and fantastically higher with Fernando and Andre Nevis, and this student of Fernando was climbing up to the top of the mountain, and he just went higher, and he got this fantastic theorem. So compact manifolds up to dimension 7, not only do you have one, which Algram Pitts had proved, but you have an infinite number of embedded compact examples. But that's using the technique created by Birkhoff to find geodesics, embedded geodesics on convex spheres by the min-max technique. You look at sweep outs and you do the min-max technique that Birkhoff created. And it works here using sweep outs of k parameters and a whole world that was created by Fernando and uh, Andre Nevis to get an infinite number. So the previous best theorem was this, was uh, proved by Fernando, Andre, and several other people. There were many theorems. But the theorem essentially said that for most metrics, the generic metrics, you do have an infinite number. Metrics of curvature greater equal to zero, Ricci curvature greater than zero, you do have an infinite number, et cetera, et cetera. There were many theorems previous to this where you had more than one, which was known by Algram Pitts. Okay. So you could try and do min max for a non compact manifold, but it's, the, I mean, nobody's managed to do that. In general, min max is hard enough on a compact manifold. Sweeping out a non compact manifold by hypersurfaces, to do min max, you want to manage to talk about the area. And when you talk about the area of complete surfaces, it could be infinite, so you have a priori many, many problems to try and solve to understand how to do it. So uh, for the moment, there's only one other idea that I have to attack a problem like that, and that's degree theory, degree theory. Now, you might ask yourself the question, what in heaven's name does degree theory have to do with this problem? <laughs> ah, that's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let me let me uh, say the theorem, and maybe I'll be able to have time, 11 minutes, uh, to explain where degree theory comes into this problem. So the theorem that, that uh, inspired the, my work on this was a really pretty paper by Chodosh and Ketoverd. which they proved the following theorem. Really, really pretty paper. Suppose M3 is complete, it's complete symmetric G. And you might as well suppose that M3 is topologically R3, topologically. And uh, Suppose that it's uh, asymptotically flat. The metric is asymptotically flat. This means that near infinity, the metric is looking more and more Euclidean. And these uh, metrics and surfaces on R3 come up in general relativity, which is the reason they looked at this problem. I mean, the positive mass uh, conjecture solved by Rick and Yao, concerned uh, asymptotically flat R3s with metrics of uh, scalar curvature greater than or equal to zero. 
and they wanted to get the theorem that the mass was positive. And uh, those are uh, time-like slices in general relativity. Here, there's no hypothesis about the scalar curvature. This is just asymptotically flat. Okay? And you take a point Q, ah, and suppose, this is a condition, suppose there are no compact minimal surfaces for this metric. Now, you can imagine having a, a metric like this. Think of this as a two-dimensional plane with the flat metric here, and just do this with the metric here to create this. You see, for this two-dimensional, here you have a geodesic that's uh, closed and compact. I can do this in R3. I can take R3. Imagine this is R3, and I create this metric here that does this in a ball, and I produce a compact minimal surface. So we're none of this phenomena for this metric G. Then the conclusion is, if you take a point Q in M, uh, there exists a properly embedded minimal plane sigma in M and Q is in sigma. That's the theorem. That given any uh, asymptotically flat three manifold which has this property, no compact minimal surfaces, then you can find such a properly embedded minimal plane and Q in sigma. This paper really got me excited because you can't use, uh, what can you use? You can't use uh, the uh, plateau problem solution technique because as a matter of fact, if this metric has positive scalar curvature, no such plane like this exists that minimizes area, that's stable. So you, the, the techniques, uh, to produce such an object here, you cannot use minim minimization, won't work. If you can't use minimization, what can you do? It's a, it's a non-compact manifold. You uh, have to do something else. And what they use is degree theory to solve this problem. They use degree theory. Well, after this, Lauren Maze and, and I considered this phenomena, and we proved the following theorem. This is with uh, myself and Laura Maze. <coughs> so there were two theorems. Suppose you take Q1, Q2, Q3 in this, this M here, this asymptotic flat M, same hypothesis, same hypothesis as the theorem of Chodosh and Ketobert. Then there exists such a sigma that passes through the three points, passes through Q1, Q2, Q3. That's one of the theorems. So like in R3, given any three points, there's a plane that passes through the three points. So in this manifold, given any three points, there's a plane, a minimal plane, that passes through the three points. It's properly embedded. Second theorem, same hypothesis, given Q in M3, take any two-dimensional plane in the tangent space to M3 and Q, given V a two plane in the tangent space to M and Q, then there exists such a sigma such that Q is in sigma and 
the tangent space to sigma q is equal to v. Just like geodesics, take any point in a reminding manifold, take any direction to the point, you have a geodesic that passes through the point with that direction. Here you can find an embedded minimal plane. Ah, I should have mentioned that this original question that I asked about, the general question for this three manifold, whether you can find a properly embedded minimal surface, let's go down to surfaces. Consider a surface of dimension two that's complete, non-compact, M2. Can you find a properly embedded geodesic to each, uh, to each point? I don't know the answer to that question, but you can ask the question, is there, does there exist a properly embedded geodesic in the surface? And that happens to be a theorem of Bangor. Two-dimensional manifold, you can always find a properly embedded, complete non-compact, complete non-compact. You can always find a properly embedded geodesic non-compact. So, I mean, just think of this as R2 with some metric, complete metric. It's not obvious. I mean, not at obvious at all. If you think about trying to do it, it's difficult. So in, in dimension two, it's true. Okay, so I have three minutes, and I have no three minutes. Uh, how to indicate where the Greek theory comes into this? Oh, I'll try. This was a theory that was originally suggested by Smale for doing sod theorems and degree theory for infinite dimensional Banach manifolds. And he proved that you can do it if you take uh, Banach maps that have, that are Fredholm maps. Then all this sod theory and degree theory can work if the map in question is a proper map. So this was proved by Smale. So what do I mean by that? So for example, suppose I take the ball in R3, B, ball in R3, of some metric G. Symmetric G. I can look at the space of all smooth Jordan curves on the boundary. C, the space of all uh, C, K, alpha, S1, boundary of B. Embeddings. Embeddings. All smooth Jordan curves on the boundary, this space. It's a Banach manifold for k greater equal to 2. Then I can look at the space of all maps f of the unit disk in R2 to the ball, which is a minimal embedding for the metric G, such that f of the boundary of the disk is contained in the sphere, and f is not tangent to the boundary of the ball. Not tangent to the boundary of the ball. I can look at that space. Okay? But here I have this indicating there's an equivalence relation. I want to consider f1 equivalent to f2 if they differ by a parameterization of the interior only, if there exists at C a diffeomorphism of the disk to itself, a diffeo, the identity on the boundary on S1, and F1 is equal to F2C. So this is the equivalence class of embedded minimal disks that send the boundary of the disk to the boundary of the ball. Here's the this. Here's the disk B. But the parameterization of the boundary is fixed. Then Brian White proved the theorem, which is not at all easy, but 
really nice theorem, very, very useful, that this M is a Banach manifold. So M and C are Banach manifolds. And the projection from M to C, the natural projection, which takes a disk with this parameterization of the boundary to the restriction to the boundary, this delta is a smooth Fred home map. Fred home of index zero. Dimension of the co-kernel is equal to the dimension of the co-kernel. So here you have the space of all smooth Jordan curves on the boundary of the ball. Here the space of all embedded minimal disks whose boundary is on the boundary. And given that, you have this nice structure of a Fred Holm map of index zero. Now, you'd like to have a degree theory. So in finite dimensional situation, you'd have a degree theory if there was a proper map. So, so this, this is theorems of Brian White. Theorem Brian White. So what is the condition that this map is proper? Well, Brian White proved that delta is proper if the boundary of B for this metric G is strictly mean convex, strictly mean convex, and There are no compact minimal surfaces inside the ball. No compact minimal surfaces in B. Beautiful theorem. Really beautiful. Really nice geometry. One of the really nice theorems in the subject. So given this kind of hypothesis on the metric in the ball, then delta has a degree. So you have the infinite dimensional version of Saad's theorem, and you can do transversality, and you could start, start working. You could start doing geometry to prove the existence of minimal disks. So let me mention that in R3, this solves the following problem. In R3, if you take a convex sphere in R3, so this is, here's a convex sphere in R3. It was an open question. When the smooth Jordan curves here bound embedded minimal disks inside? And using degree theory, this theorem, one knows that for almost every smooth curve on the boundary, almost every smooth Jordan curve on the boundary, there's an odd number, exactly an odd number, of embedded minimal disks with that boundary. So in R3, you don't need this hypothesis about compact minimal surfaces. There are no compact minimal surfaces. You just need this to be strictly mean convex. So it could be just, it doesn't have to be convex, just mean convex. It could be a, a dumbbell shape. But you have the existence then of, since it's an odd number, you have at least one. And it was not known if it was true that there exists at least one. <coughs> OK, so that's an indication why degree theory enters into the subject. Thank you very much. Questions? Perguntas? Okay, if, if not, let's thank Harold again. <laughs>